Hi there. Welcome to an introduction to learning catalytics for all disciplines. We're going to take a little time here to uh, get introduced to learning catalytics. And as we do this, we're going to spend uh, about 90 minutes together today looking at uh, a presentation first, and then we'll go live and actually build the course. Uh, I'm Terry Austin, the guy in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen there. You see my contact information there, and I'll provide it also again uh, toward the end of the program. So without further ado, uh, let's take a look at learning catalytics. This is the first of two session types we offer. Uh, it is the introductory session. You will leave this session with the ability to uh, create and run your own learning catalytics courses. Uh, if you'd like more information, then you can check into the uh, more advanced course, which I'll show you here in a few moments. But uh, with that, let's dive in and take a look at learning catalytics. This is indeed a bring your own device system, and that for a lot of instructors raises some concerns. So this is the time to sort of face and defeat your enemy in the classroom, that cell phone, that connected device. Uh, these can be turned to your advantages, and I will show you as we get into this session how that works. Uh, for a lot of you, uh, and myself included, I had a, a slide that I used to show at the beginning of most of my semesters asking my students to turn their phones off. <clears throat> I've actually uh, now taken a complete 180 on this, and I want to make certain my students have their phones, their tablets, their laptops out, and are connected in my classroom. Uh, I'll make a case for that, I think, as we go through the next hour or so together. So just bear with me, and I think I can change your mind on that score. Um, you have probably found me today through the link I'm about to show you on the main Learning Catalytics website. In the menu, you'll find the link for training. When you click that training link, you're going to find several options, including some How Do I videos, some implementation guide. The highlighted one here is online training. Uh, and what you can find when you come to online training is the ability to sign up for a workshop like the one you are watching right now. Um, the calendar is a little dated, forgive that. What we're looking at is the introductory session here. Uh, it used to be called Getting Started, now it's called Introduction to Learning Catalytics. Uh, the one we're seeing today is all disciplines, so it doesn't matter if you're using Mastering or MyLab or simply a standalone uh, learning catalytics with no ties to any other Pearson product whatsoever. This is the beginning course. The next session type, should you want a little bit more information, is called Strategies for Learning Catalytics. It's a more advanced course. It touches on some features that we won't have time to get at here today. And if you find yourself after today wanting a bit more information, this is the place to come next. So without further ado, let's begin our uh, look into learning catalytics. Uh, I would ask you what's happening on these devices in your classrooms right now. You probably don't know, but I will show you you can tell using learning catalytics when the students are participating or when perhaps they're doing something they shouldn't be doing and I'll show you that process as we get a little bit farther into the day. <clears throat> this is, as I've said a couple of times, a bring your own device system. That would include things like smartphones, tablets, laptops. You may even have a classroom that's got individual workstations at student desk. I happen to have a classroom like that myself. What you and your students will get out of this is uh, assessment. If you've ever used any other classroom clicker type device, where you ask a question, the students respond, <clears throat> and perhaps they get credit for that response, you'll have that ability here in Learning Catalytics. You'll also get some really innovative opportunities for student engagement. I'll show you a couple of those today. Uh, one I'll go into some detail and one I'll simply allude to. Uh, one type of student engagement is group discussions while a question is taking place, and I will definitely show you that. Another kind of student engagement is team activities. And I'll give you a peek into that, but I'll save most of the explanation of that for our strategy session. Finally, what you as the instructor get is a very robust classroom intelligence system. I hinted a moment ago that you could tell when the students were participating or perhaps doing something they shouldn't be doing. That's part of this classroom intelligence system, along with a few other things that I'll hint at as we go along the way today. <clears throat> now, let me start here by showing there are five separate kinds of assignments, referred to as modules, that you can create. If you're familiar with the more traditional clicker type system, then this first session type, an instructor-led synchronous, 
is probably where you're going to be most familiar and most comfortable. In fact, it's where most instructors probably get started. The instructor's at the front of the classroom. They're giving their traditional lecture. At some point, they pause. They ask a question. The students respond. And when the instructor is happy with those responses, they move on. Now, you do have one option here in the instructor-led synchronous. If you're not satisfied with how many students got that question correct, you can actually assign them to groups, let them have a group discussion, and then let them respond a second or even a third time to the same question. Um, a bit more about that in a specific example later on, but that's instructor-led synchronous. Uh, that is one of five module types. Another module type is automated synchronous. Again, when you hear, when you hear the word module, think assignment. Uh, you can repeat assignments for subsequent sections uh, so you don't have to recreate them every time you have a class. Um, automated synchronous uh, lets the instructor present a set of questions when the instructor themselves is not present. This is a session type that's really quite good for an online course, a hybrid course. Uh, you provide a set login time. You give that time to the students. They log in, and at that login time, the system begins asking everybody who's logged in question one. And then after a predetermined wait period, that moves on to question two. The instructor does not have to be present at all, although the instructor can peek in and see what's going on with the session if they want to. You can even have the same module delivered at multiple times, perhaps three in the afternoon on a Wednesday and eight o'clock again that night for students who got off work late. Uh, so that's automated synchronous, and again, really quite good for an online session. Uh, the next two have a lot of things that are similar about them and some things that are different, so let me discuss how these two are alike, and then I'll go into how self-test is a bit more advanced than self-paced. In both a self-paced and self-test session, the students can log in at any time that the session is live. I will often leave these open for several days myself, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But in either self-paced or self-test, the students can move through the questions in any order they want. So they can maybe answer question one, question two, decide that question three is a little hard, they want to come back to it a little bit later on, they can skip it and come back, no problem at all. When they're finished, they turn in their work and they're given a grade. Maybe they got 17 out of 20 right. And in self-paced, that is literally all the interaction they have. They answer questions, turn it in, get a grade. Uh, self-test is a little bit more advanced. In the self-test, the students still respond to questions in any order. But one thing that we did not see over in self-paced is as they answer each question, they're given some feedback. They're told whether they're right or wrong. And in addition to that, if the instructor writing the questions wants to, they can include a sentence, a couple of words, or even a paragraph of feedback for the students to read after they've already answered. In other words, you can put in a statement there that says, this is what you should have understood in order to answer the question. I, myself, will commonly use a self-test as a pre-lecture exam review. Uh, I will have an exam that covers two or three chapters, and for each chapter I might have 15, 20, even 30 questions. And as the students are going through, recall that they're told as they answer each question if it's right or wrong, and on the more difficult questions, they'll even see feedback uh, that I've put in for them to understand. So it makes the students feel they're much more prepared for my upcoming exams. One side note, notice that both of these, self-paced and self-test, end in the same four words, typically outside of class, typically outside of class. And while that initially was true when these statement, when these session types <clears throat> were first recorded, there's absolutely no reason that you could not use either self-paced or self-test for an in-class quiz. That traditional time where we as instructors have said, okay, take out your pen and paper, we're gonna have a pop quiz, you can certainly do that in class. Open one of these session types up for 10 or 15 minutes, let the students answer five or 10 questions, and let the system grade it so you don't have to. Now the last module type, team-based assessment, is a bit more advanced. It's one of those grouping activities that I'd like to talk about, and I'm not gonna go into great details on this because I'm gonna save the real explanation for the uh, more advanced strategy session, but I'm gonna tell you briefly that in a team-based assessment, 
the students actually respond at least two separate times to each question. The first time they respond, they're answering the question entirely on their own, and they're not given any feedback as to whether they're right or wrong. The second time they answer it, they're answering as part of a team, and when anybody in the team answers, they're answering for the entire team. You, as the instructor, can actually set how a student's grade is calculated based on uh, a slider, and you drag the slider all the way to the left or all the way to the right. If it's all the way to the left, Amy's grade is based 100% on Amy's individual answer. Drag it all the way to the right, and Amy's grade is based entirely on what Amy's team answered, and you can stop that continuum anywhere along the way with that slider. I commonly have that as a 60-40 split, where Amy's grade is 40% based on her individual answer and 60% based on the team answer. This makes for some very interesting group discussions in my classrooms, and I'll do that commonly for some of my more difficult lecture topics with the individual round the night before the lecture and the team round occurring on the morning before I deliver the lecture. So more on that in the strategy session. There's a really cool opportunity for some student interaction, and it's called a team-based assessment. Now let's take a look at our next slide here, which is a look at how you build your course. And there are a couple of different ways to do this. We today are in a all disciplines session. So this first way would be what you would do to create a course if you were not using any other Pearson product. In other words, you're just going to Learning Catalytics and building a course. If you're using Mastering or MyLab, I'll show you in a moment how you'll do yours in a very specific, different way for a particular purpose. But for now, let's look at what happens if you just need to go to the Learning Catalytics website and build a course. You'll be logged in as yourself, uh, registered for your campus, and you will do what is, I hope, obvious here. You'll click the button that says Create a Course. As soon as you click that, you've begun building the course. Uh, you'll see as the requester comes forward here what you're going to be doing. You will put in a name for your course, hopefully something more imaginative than my fall course. As soon as you've typed in that name, then you're going to come down to the uh, drop-down menu and pick the discipline here, computer science. Pretty much any discipline you can imagine is selected here. One reason that you want to select the appropriate discipline is that there are a lot of pre-made questions that might make your life a lot easier without having to write every single question. You hit save and continue, and at that point you have built your course. Now let's take a quick look at how you would do that from either Mastering or MyLab. We'll look at Mastering first. Whenever you're logged into your Mastering course, uh, you might need to toggle open this little in-class learning panel here, but as soon as you do that, you'll see a Learning Catalytics link. Click that link and that's going to pop open a new window that has two buttons, Preview and Setup and Use with Students. We're going to select Preview and Setup first, and what that's going to do is it's going to build your course on Learning Catalytics with the same name as your mastering course. This is very important that you do it this way, because what happens when you build a course this way is the Learning Catalytics course is linked back to your gradebook on mastering. So that's step one. That builds your course when you click the Preview and Setup button. Step two, come back into Mastering, click the Learning Catalytics link again, and click Use with Students. That's going to do something very important for your students. By the way, I didn't have a check here, but you should probably check this checkbox that says Notify Students. Now, when you click this button over on a student page, and I'm going to give you a rare instructor's peek into a student page, but when you do that process, your students now, on their login page in Mastering, have a new link that they did not have before. It's called in-class learning. It was not there before until you go through a course this way. And they actually have a big blue button that says, notice it, there is a learning catalytic session in progress. Join now to participate. So anytime you have a session live and running, all they have to do is click join now and they're in. So that's how you would build a course in mastering. And the two big benefits that you and your students have is that for you, anything you do in Learning Catalytics gets linked back to the gradebook. And for your students, they've got a handy, easy to join, single click sign in from mastering. Now on MyLab, 
pretty much the same process I just showed you on mastering. Your learning catalytics link is right here. When you click it, you've got the same two buttons that pop up, preview and setup, and use with students. The logic that I just explained over in mastering applies here. You'll have a tie back to your gradebook, and your students will also have the uh, individual blue button to click to log in. So that's how you build your course from either no tie to Pearson, from mastering, or from my labs standalone. So there you go. Uh, that gets your course built, and we'll actually do one of those whenever we go live in a little bit. For now, let's take a quick look at classroom seat maps. For some reason, my title has disappeared here, but that title should say seat map. Uh, here we see a seat map uh, of a room that I teach in quite commonly. Every single square represents one student seat. <clears throat> the students would walk in, look at the seat map, and click to identify what chair they're sitting in. You don't have to do seat mapping, but it does give you some very robust opportunities that you can uh, see uh, in a few moments, so I'll show you some benefits. Uh, this is a seat map that uh, is used by uh, my girlfriend, Peg. She teaches at a college campus about 30 miles down the road from me. I'm in a small format classroom myself. She's in a very large format classroom. It seats about 150 students. Um, in a room that's this complex, you can take advantage of another feature that I'll show you when we build a course. You can actually assign seat numbers to individual chairs. For instance, in this large auditorium, the students sitting in that chair might not recognize whether they're in this chair or this chair or this chair. They can actually type in something on the order of seat, row E, seat 14, and I'll show you that process in a bit. It's not hard to do at all. Now, one other seat map item that I'd like to discuss is a beginning of the classroom intelligence system. Now, the room I'm showing you now belongs to a buddy of mine, Matthew Stolpus, who teaches chemistry at Ohio State. I'm going to get my pointer out of the way. So what we're seeing here is actually a video. And you can see Matthew's pointer here as he's uh, pointing something out to us on the video. What I want to show you here is the colors on the screen as you preview the seat map while the question is being asked. Um, we see red, green, light gray, and dark gray. And I'm actually going to do you the honor of assuming you understand already that green is somebody who got the question right and red is somebody who got the question wrong. I really want to focus instead on what's going on with the light gray and the dark gray. Light gray chairs are in the moment empty. Nobody clicked and said, I'm sitting here today. So what I want to point out here is that I would quite commonly go on a proverbial witch hunt for dark gray chairs. A dark gray chair has a student who has clicked and said effectively, I'm sitting here today. So I might, on this day in this classroom, walk up this aisle and look over the shoulder of this student and say, hey, Tom, it looks to me like you're having trouble answering the question. Is there something I can do to help you? And as I look down at his laptop and see Facebook on the screen, he knows he's just been busted. So that is one portion of that classroom intelligence system that I was describing a little earlier. You can actually tell who's playing along or maybe who's just screwing around. Now, before we leave seat maps altogether, I do want to point out that I do not, have not ever had assigned seating. I personally don't care if I know where somebody's setting. I don't want the system to know where somebody's setting, and this is one reason why. So that is seat mapping and uh, why you might care about that. Uh, let's take a look next at another component of the classroom intelligence system that is live tracking of comprehension. <clears throat> what I commonly ask instructors when I get to this particular topic is when have you got an idea that you've lost a student? And for most of us, it's going to be after the first or second exam. For me, in my classroom, it's something on the order of maybe 9.30 in the morning in the middle of a lecture. <clears throat> what we're seeing here, forgive my voice, by the way, <clears throat> what we're seeing here is the instructor interface for learning catalytics while a module is being delivered. By the way, this is that first module type. This is an instructor-led session, an instructor-led synchronous session. I've got a bunch of questions stacked up here to ask. By the way, I would never, on any given class day, have 16 separate questions stacked up to answer. This is purely for demonstration purposes. We'll see something like this when we go live. 
uh, and it's nice to show you a variety of question types, but more normally, I would ask perhaps three or four questions in an hour. But really, what I want you to see on this slide is the flat red line that suddenly jumps up. This is called, by Learning Catalytics, the reaction graph. <clears throat> and the way that line jumped up is some student somewhere in the room clicked, I don't understand, on their device. When they click, I don't understand, that red line jumps up on my instructor interface. <clears throat> Excuse me for a little pause there. I had a little cough off monitor. Now, let me briefly tell you what's going on with technology in my classroom as we look at this. This is a view that I usually have on some kind of secondary device. Maybe it's a laptop that I carried in with me. Maybe it's an iPad. It can even be a smartphone. My lecture is going on from the podium computer. That podium computer is projecting typical lecture slides up on the big screen like you've always done, like I've always done. This view is something my students typically don't see. I'm watching this out of my peripheral vision, and if that red line jumps up because some student clicked, I don't understand, I usually catch that out of the corner of my eye, and I know that that explanation that I thought was ever so clever didn't get through to somebody. So I'll back up a moment or two and revisit the topic that I just described in the hopes that I see something like this with that red line dropping back down the baseline, and my explanation has fixed it. If that itself is not sufficient, the student can always send a private message, and I'll show you that topic a little bit later on, because that's something the students can do at any point. So that is live tracking with a reaction graph. You have to physically turn that on as you build your course, and I'll show you how to do that later on. And then you actually have to click this open while you're running the session to see the reaction graph. Now, you can actually do all of this from a smartphone, and you see that here, which kind of brings me naturally to the next slide, what the instructor mobile interface looks like. So if you've got a department that's not going to give you a second laptop or an iPad, you can actually drive all of this from your smartphone here. We see that same reaction graph I was just showing you. If your students were to send you a message, you would see private messages coming in your inbox. You can actually scroll through the questions. We see that here in vertical mode. We're reading a question here on the screen. If I want to deliver this particular question at this moment, I click this button and that'll send it out to my students. Or I can swipe the screen from uh, right to left and look at question two or question three or however many questions I've got stacked up. I deliver questions from my smartphone to my students on a pretty regular basis, and I can tell you that this process works very smoothly. So if you're not getting some extra device from your uh, department, don't feel you can't run learning catalytics. Simply pull out your smartphone and you're good to go. Now, it's not fair to me for me to show you the instructor experience without showing at least a little of the student experience. And what I've chosen to show here is probably the most popular device in my classroom, and that is a smartphone. When a student first walks in, assuming I have a session running, they see the session number here, and all they've got to do to join is to simply click this button. Otherwise, if they've never joined a session, I usually will write the session number, which is unique every single time you start learning catalytics. I'll write that number on the board. They put it in here and click join, and as soon as they click join, and what happens is they're asked, at least in my classroom, to tell the system where they're setting. Now keep in mind a couple of things here. Seat mapping is not required in learning catalytics. So you might not see this if you're not using a seat map. But you do get some added benefits, including a couple of things I've shown you already. So as soon as the student clicks show me the seat map, they see the map, and then they come down here and click on the chair. You saw somebody click that right there to say, I'm sitting here today. Maybe they were over here yesterday. And then they click OK. And at that point, the student screen changes to a very basic interface. And this, for most of the time while I'm talking in my lecture, is what my students see. The view only changes for them when I ask a question. But at any point in my lecture, they can click, I don't understand, and that will cause the red reaction graph line to jump up. They can also, at any point, send a private message to the instructor. 
So that's where the student typically is. I'm giving my lecture, and at some point in that lecture, I'm going to decide it's time to ask a question. And when I ask my question, contrary to the old clickers where the question appears up on the big screen, the question appears actually on the student's device. So you ready? Here comes a question to this student. It's going to be a picture, and the student is going to be asked to identify something in the picture. In this case, they're going to be asked to identify a part of the spinal cord. They touch. It leaves a blue dot where they touch to show them where their answer is. They hit submit response. And notice what happens within just a second or two. Their uh, screen is hidden, and it says here your response has been hidden for privacy. Click show response to see it or change response if you want to replace your current answer with a new one. What you and I know looking at this is what's really being said in that first sentence is, hey, we hid your answer so your neighbor doesn't peek. Now, you might be a little concerned in that they do have the ability to change their answer. They can only change their answer as long as you, the instructor, is still delivering the question. As soon as you stop delivery, they can no longer change their answer. It's locked in. So that's the student interface. That's what their experience is like. Let me show you a few question types. If you have any experience at all with a clicker, or frankly, even with multiple choice test, then you aren't going to be surprised at all with a few question type options. You can do multiple choice. You can do short answer. You can do numerical. Uh, but learning catalytics goes a bit beyond that with a grand total of 19 separate item types. I'm not going to go over all of these, but I will touch on a few just to kind of point a few out. Many choice is a glorified multiple choice, but there's more than one right answer. Matching is done better in learning catalytics than any system I have ever seen. It's actually spectacularly easy both for the instructor to create a matching question. We'll do that a little bit later when we go live. And for the students to answer a matching question. Direction. This has some interesting uh, possibilities. Uh, the system can grade what I'm about to describe, but you can actually show a picture of a map and ask the students to uh, put an arrow in the flow of a particular river. <clears throat> you can actually show some weather patterns and ask the students to indicate which direction the wind is blowing. If you're doing cell biology, you could show a membrane and ask which direction that a particular ion might flow. If you're looking at a mathematical plot, you might indicate a trend line. And the system has the ability to grade those. And I'll show you an example of one of those a bit later on. Long answer, God help your students. You can even have them write an essay. Image upload is one I'm going to show you on our very next slide. So I'm going to save a description of that. So I've got some nice things to talk about on our next slide. A few moments ago, when you saw a picture of a spinal cord and saw a student touching a part of it to identify a particular part of the image that was uploaded, that was a region question. It's exceptionally good for teaching anatomy, perhaps even geography. Um, expression is where the students enter a mathematical expression, and as long as what they type in is algebraically or mathematically equivalent to the ideal answer the instructor includes, they'll be counted correct. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm coughing off mic again. Now, there are two question types, priority and ranking, where a student can put a list of items in a particular order. If you've got a list of items that belong in one specific order, then you probably want to use a priority question. If, on the other hand, you've got a group of mathematical items where some might be greater or less than or even equal to each other, then you probably want to consider a ranking question. So if item A is greater than item B, then they go in that order. On the other hand, if C and D are equal, it doesn't matter what order they're in. And a ranking question can do that for you. Sketch and composite sketch both let the students draw on an uploaded image, uh, commonly maybe graph paper, or perhaps a biological image like an open heart where they're tracing the pathway of blood flow through the heart, or a maze where they're literally tracing the pathway through a maze. Uh, Word cloud is really quite good for classroom discussions. Uh, this is not typically a question type used for a grade, but you ask for students' opinions on something, and the more popular the answer is, the larger that item is in the word cloud. Uh, those are question types. I'm going to move on to the next example, and I'm going to show you an image upload example. Uh, 
this is great for doing anatomy. Uh, also, perhaps for general biology, I can give you an example along the way there, but let me just show you what I did with my students. Now, full disclosure, I happen to teach anatomy and physiology, and a lot of my examples you're going to see are the only real examples I can do as I get real questions done with my students. And this one happens to be an anatomy question, and my students are asked to please go into the anatomy lab and using the camera on their smartphone to take a close-up photo of a cerebellum. Within a moment or two of this question going live in my classroom, I started seeing these answers coming in from my students. Now, these are their answers, an image that they've uploaded. Uh, you could instead, in maybe a uh, botany class, send students out on the campus to take photos of a live oak, take photos of a rhododendron, take photos of a rose bush, take photos of a newt, take photos of a monarch butterfly, and this is a great way to upload questions like this. My students, by the way, have started calling this question type the lab scavenger hunt. Now, I will say this, the system is not clever enough to look at a photograph and know if it's right or wrong, so the system over in the gradebook marks everybody is correct. You, the instructor, open the gradebook after the event and take a look at it. What you see is a list of student names. By the way, I've blocked out all my student names for FERPA. The background color for everybody is green because everybody was marked right. All you have to do is click mark as incorrect to turn it red. And as you see here, this is the thumbnail that this student took. If I click on it, I would see this image. And the clever on you might say, hey, Terry, looks like that student actually did have a cerebellum, but I said close-up photo. So what I did here was I clicked Add Comment, and I told this student, I think you're probably right, but I would like you to go back and either use the same model or another model, center on your subject, and zoom in more. And this student in round two of this question actually got that right. Now, another application that I see for this question type serving a really productive function is for the folks doing mathematics. Perhaps you ask two questions. One has a numerical answer, and the second follow-up question is, please show me your work. They could then use their phone camera, take a photograph of the page where they worked out the mathematical problem that you had presented them, and then you could click Add Comment and perhaps say something like, they're on line three, I think your mistake is in the sign. Perhaps it should be positive instead of negative. Now, I don't teach math. You guys can come up with your own explanation of what you might actually say there. But image upload is a great show your work option. <clears throat> now, what I'd like to talk about next is something I alluded to very early on in our time together, and that is group discussions. There will come a time when not enough students get the question correct to suit you. Um, I personally use the parameter that Dr. Eric Mazur, the inventor of learning catalytics, used, uh, and his parameter for deciding when it's time to let the students talk about a topic is when that group of students has between 30 and 70 percent with the correct answer. 30 to 70 percent got the answer right. Mazur calls this the sweet spot. And the logic here is pretty straightforward. If you've got a situation where less than 30 percent of the class got it right, they don't understand the topic well enough to talk about it. On the other hand, if we've got the other alternative here, where more than 70% got the question right, then frankly, the students get it, and I don't want to waste my lecture time letting them have a discussion. So what will happen here is if we have that 30 to 70% sweet spot, we have a great opportunity for student discussions. So let me show you an example where that was going on. Again, this is a real example with my own students in my own class. It happens to be heart physiology, you don't need to worry about the details. What I do want you to notice is that 68% of the students got that question right. We are firmly in that 30 to 70% sweet spot. My next task is to click the Assign Groups option. When I do that, I get a window popping up letting me configure how my students will be grouped. I'm going to put them in groups of three. You can change the group size if you want to. Based on the answer they gave me, where not all the answers are the same. By the way, there's a couple of other options here. One option is where everybody in the group has got the same opinion. Frankly, for me, that makes boring discussions. The other option is all different. 
I'd be a little careful with that one, especially in the small classroom. It's hard to get several groups where everybody in every group all has different answers than everybody else in the group. I like the middle ground of not all the same. And you can configure how far apart they're setting. My suggestion here is if you're in one of those large auditoriums where the seats don't move, maybe you want them sitting next to each other. Uh, the last option here deals with what happens when the first four leave somebody out. And the option that I like is to ask them to move into another group. The alternative there is to have them set out of the discussion. I really don't like that. I like everybody to participate. So I'm about to click group and deliver. And what I want you to see here is something very special happens on the student's device. The next image you're going to see when I click group and deliver is a student's phone. Let's pretend just for a moment that this is my student, Mark. Watch what Mark is being told, and I want you to kind of really get the power of this next image. Mark sees this. Please discuss your response with Terry. Terry's sitting in front of you, and Fred, who's sitting in front of you to your right. They're seeing the same question again. Now, forgive me, this is not the same question we just saw on the previous page. But this is a way of showing you what the student sees. More importantly, though, especially early in the semester, the students are being introduced to the people around them. Uh, they have time to talk. I give them no more than three minutes for this discussion. This is a discussion such as this going on in my classroom where I've got groups of three. This girl's looking at her tablet and talking to her group. This one is pointing out an appropriate region in the text. And this guy is looking here, participating in the discussion. Two more pictures and we'll move on from here. Uh, in this image, <clears throat> you can see three students going over uh, some notes. This one's looking at her phone. This one's looking at her tablet. This young lady's got her phone out and they're going over the topic. Uh, this last picture perhaps is my favorite in the whole set. Uh, we had a little overflow, so this group actually had four in it. This student, one of my best in the last 10 years, is pointing out the relevant part of the text. Notice that this student and this student are both seeing the same question on their device. In fact, there's the picture in the textbook that's the same as the picture and the question. But notice something else here. The question reflows and is ideally laid out for the device. It looks different on her phone than it does on her tablet. Now, at this point, you might be concerned about how much time these discussions take. I'm going to make a couple of points here. First of all, the discussion time is limited to three minutes, and then they have to deliver their answer. So this is not ever going to take more than three minutes of my lecture. The other point to keep in mind is this only gets done when 70% or less got the question right. Usually in my classes, more than that are getting it right. So this might happen. I might lose three minutes of lecture, perhaps once or twice a week at most. The students love these discussions, though, and you'll find that they tend to be quite productive. And let me show you on this next slide just how productive that can be. Here is the result after they've had three minutes of discussion. Round one. 68% got it right. But what happened in round two? After three minutes of discussion, 100% got the question right. This crowd is who's responsible. This is a peer discussion. Now, it might look at first glance like I picked my best example to show you this. I've been doing this for about three years now, and I will tell you in these group discussions, I never see less than a 10% increase between round one and round two. And it is quite commonly, as you see in this example, more like 20 to 30% increase. And this crowd and the peer-to-peer -peer discussion is what's making that possible. All right, let's move on to our next topic, and that is student questions are driving my lectures. Uh, remember the student interface, they've got the ability to send a message to the instructor. What I thought would happen with this option is exactly what did not happen. What I expected was stuff like this. This looks really hard. Is, it gonna, is this going to be on the test? Um, I had to write that to show you in order to make it happen. That really is not a real thing. Instead, what I often see is very insightful questions from my students. Now, I'm not sure who's listening to this recording. I don't know if you're doing math or physics or English. 
or business. So forgive me, I do anatomy and physiology. This happens to be a physiology question. Uh, endocrinology to be very specific. Uh, but for those of you who happen to be science oriented, you might get how profound this moment was for me at 9.47 on this morning. My student asked, our text indicates that melatonin has anti-gonadotropic effects. At this moment in my lecture, I had not talked about this. I had no idea that they even knew what anti-gonadotropic meant. But the question is quite profound. Are regions in longer dark days more likely to have slower sexual maturity in developing children, and conversely, to countries with lots of sunshine, have earlier puberty? Great question. It fit the lecture material perfectly. It diverted my lecture by about five minutes, and then we moved on. This is not an isolated incident. Here are a couple more in that same vein. This top question is about as uh, intense as the previous one, but I really want to focus on this simpler question on the bottom. Uh, you, right now listening to this recording, put your hand over your throat covering the region you might commonly call your Adam's apple. You're now holding uh, the front portion of your thyroid gland. On the back of that, there are a couple of little glands called parathyroids. You've got between four and eight of those. And this student asked on this day, is there any particular characteristic that determines how many parathyroid glands you have, or is it random? It's not a tough question, and it diverted my lecture that day by maybe a minute. But the student got the impression, realistically, that her questions mattered. At the time she asked this, she had finished one exam and she was a low C student. She ended the semester after having asked a bunch of questions like this with a high B. She started paying attention, she focused her studies, and she actually, as a result, uh, got into the nursing program. And I'd like to think that learning catalytics played a small role in that. Now, one thing before I leave this, notice the instructor's option when students ask a question. The only thing you can do is mark this as red. There is no place for you to click to answer the student. You answer the student the way you have always answered student questions, out loud to the class. This send a message to the instructor is never designed to be a private chat between you and the kid in the third row. Um, if you get inappropriate questions, it's perfectly fine to either mark them as red and not respond at all, I will commonly say something like, hey, a great question just came in and we'll be addressing it in tomorrow's lecture, I'll save it. Or I might say a question came in, it really doesn't apply, but if you would like to send me an email, we can have a private discussion about that later on. So that is what happens when students use the send a message to the instructor button. Uh, before we go online, I'd like to talk a little bit about studies that support systems like learning catalytics. Uh, this was written by a group at a little place called Stanford. This was done in the summer of 2013. If you'd like to look up the article, simply Google Stanford Report, July 16, 2013, and the article title is Classes Should Do Hands-On Exercises Before Reading and Video. Now, full disclosure, learning catalytics was not a part of this study, but other similar systems are. And I want to pull forward two favorite quotes from this article that I think are relevant. The first one, our results suggest that students are better prepared to understand the theory after first exploring by themselves and tangible user interfaces are well suited for that purpose. That, folks, is precisely what learning catalytics is, a tangible user interface for this kind of interaction. My favorite quote, though, is this last one. We're showing that exploration, inquiry, and problem solving are not just nice things to have in the classroom, but these are powerful learning mechanisms that increase performance by every measure we have. That, for me, is probably the most profound supporting statement I can give you for learning catalytics, and it's certainly quite accurate. And I hope I've shown you some of that, and we'll continue to do that as we go live here in just a moment. Now, you actually have the ability to get continuing ed credit for taking this course, and I'll show you that process in a little bit, but I'm also going to invite you to go live online, and if you're watching the recording, of course, you're not going to be able to go live, but I'm going to show you both the uh, student side and the instructor side of this session. Uh, where you can go, if you have not yet created an account, 
is www.learningcatalytics.com forward slash demo. And the forward slash demo is the important part because it gets you to a login where you can create a temporary account. This is also, by the way, a great site for you to use with your students if you'd like to play. Just add forward slash demo. Uh, Learning Catalytics at this point will really ask you for three pieces of information. It'll ask you for first name, last name, and email address. Um, you can put in completely fake things here if you want. I quite commonly in doing this will be Fred Flintstone, uh, bedrock at gmail.com. You must check the first checkbox or this won't work. You don't have to check the uh, bottom checkbox to get extra email. When you click start, you're in and going. Now, if you are getting continuing education credit, you do need to do a small project, and I'd like to show you what that project will be. Uh, so keep in mind the criteria as I show you this, and I'll indicate how to do those as we build a course live together in a moment. So the project for continuing ed credit is this. You must build a learning catalytics course. Surprise! <clears throat> that course should have a seat map. That course should have the reaction graph enabled, uh, and I'll show you how to do that when we go live. You should build a module that's got at least five question types, each question of a different type. You can build more if you like, but at least five different question types. Once you've built this course and met these criteria, you should create a PDF that includes screenshots showing these required components. Email that PDF to facultytraining at pearson.com. The subject line should include Mastering Introduction to Learning Catalytics Project Submission. Uh, and you would include the presenter's name, in this case that would be Terry Austin, as well as your own name, school affiliation, and the content information uh, included up here in the body of the email. <clears throat> so that would be how you would get continuing ed credit for having watched this video. Let me take you now live to a uh, Learning Catalytics website where we'll be building a course. Now, obviously you're not live if you're watching a recording, but uh, this is the process you would use. We're going to go to learningcatalytics.com. I'm going to sign in as myself. By the way, here's the training link that I mentioned a bit ago. If you click on pricing, you can see what this would cost you and your students. This is always free for the instructor, $12 for six months for your students or $20 for the whole year. I'm going to sign in. Forgive me taking a moment there to type those items in. <clears throat> you may, if you've been using Learning Kellex for a while, get some notices of courses that will be expiring. Uh, I'm going to click right now, Create Course. Now, if you were using this from inside Mastering, we'll call you, we click the Learning Catalytics link to build that. This process is what you would use if you're not using Mastering, not using MyLab. So we're going to call this one Demo Course 11116. We're going to choose our discipline. You can see as I scroll through here some of the disciplines that are available. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to pick something familiar to myself as I scroll through here. Come on down to Anatomy and Physiology, it's a favorite one of mine. And I'm going to hit Save and Continue. Again, a little pause for a cough off screen. Now, there's a couple of things going on here. We need to build a seat map, so I'm going to do that in just a moment. I'm going to build a new classroom. But one thing I said you needed to have for a continuing ed credit was the real-time graph enabled. I'm going to do that quickly by checking this checkbox. That checkbox enables the I don't understand button on my student device and gives me the opportunity to turn on the reaction graph, so that's done there. I'm going to build a classroom. I'm going to click Create New Classroom. As I do that, I'm going to call this Demo11116. Happens to be the uh, 11th of January as I type this. You could, by the way, call this Math Hall Room 123. No problem at all. Uh, in fact, that's a quite nice way to name it after the room number itself. I'll hit Save and Continue, and we're now finding ourselves at the Course Creation window. I'm going to add a single seat. I'm going to move that over here. I often put a single seat in the front of the room to represent my instructor chair. And now I can also add blocks of chairs. 
I'm going to add a block that is five across and four down. There that block is. I'll move it over here. I'm going to add another block that's the same size. And perhaps I'm even in a room that's got some ADA compliant wheelchairs. So I'll make a block that is two across one down and we'll add that block. So these two chairs come over here and those are perhaps my wheelchair accessible chairs in this room. You can even click and drag to select chunks of seats. So I'll grab and drag a row between those. Do that again. And we'll do that one more time. And then maybe even add some uh, wheelchair accessible chairs to the other side of the room. And now we've got a reasonably simple room built, and I'm going to save that, and that will automatically associate it to the course we're building right now. And there we go. So I built a course that's got a name, it has a discipline, it's got a classroom map assigned to it, and I have now enabled the reaction graph. Let me get that checkbox checked again. And I'm going to scroll on down here, and I'll save this class. So now we have built our course, the reaction graph is enabled, and we have a seat map associated with it. I'm now going to create a module. I'm going to make an assignment for my students to see. We'll call this one First Assignment, Chapter 1. And I'm going to put a date on here. You don't have to put a date. <clears throat> the date, by the way, primarily affects how this is sorted in the Table of Contents list of assignments. I'll put in tomorrow. For today, I'm going to use the instructor-led synchronous session, and I'll hit save and continue, and now we're ready to start building some questions. So I could add a question from the library. Remember the system already knows I'm teaching an anatomy and physiology course. I can look for Pearson content, or I can search for community contributed content. As you yourself write questions, you have the option to click a checkbox to share with other instructors. Uh, you can even do that and type in the name of a instructor. So if we type in Terry Austin, you can see some questions that I've written in the past. Holy moly. We'll just search on my last name. Now, I'm going to get out of this, go back to Pearson content. In fact, I'm going to get out of picking questions from somebody else. I'm going to show you how to write some questions. To create a new question. Now you saw the options of question type earlier. I can scroll through those as I scroll across here. And let me do a very simple question first. We'll do multiple choice. Anyway, let's do many choice. What I am going to write is going to fit that better. Color or colors are apples typically. And let's do red, green, brown, orange, and pink. And the correct options here would be red and green. I'll randomize those and maybe I'll say to my students after they've answered this, It's a nice little explanation. All red delicious apples are commonly red. Granny Smith apples are often green. We'll save that. Now there's two right answers and the student needs to pick both of those to get that right. Create a new question. I told you earlier that matching is really, really easy to write and answer. Let me show you one of those. Pick the typical color for the food item. Uh, it's close to lunchtime as I write this. Maybe I'm getting hungry, who knows? Bananas, yellow, apple, red, lime, green. Let's give a easy one here. Orange, orange, and let's stop with that. Now you need to check that the, uh, leave this check, the question has a correct response reflected by the above pairings and randomize the order and we'll save that out.
I'm going to do one more question here. And for this one, I'm going to do a sketch. Please help the rat find his way to the end of the maze. This is a sketch question. This one is a little tricky. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drag my web page off to the left a little bit. I'm going to open a folder on my computer. I'm going to bring that folder over here for you to see. We've got some pictures in here. I'm looking for a maze. Let me go to the list view. It's a little easier to see this. Classic maze. Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to slide down, still in the question creation menu. I've got to add images button. I can do one of two things. I can click this button and browse, or I can simply grab the picture, drag it onto the button, and drop it. And what will happen here, you'll see in a little bit, I'm going to save that one for a bit, and I'll show you all these questions as we get a little bit farther in. Now, I'm going to stop this, and you know what, I'm going to add one more question just for grins. Let's do a word cloud question. Wake up and smell the blank. All right, I've got four questions written, and what I'd like to do here is deliver these questions to you and let you see what this is like. Um, I'm going to save this. We'll finish it out. We have one assignment ready to go, and I'm going to show you one little handy trick that you can use as you practice yourself. Uh, notice there is in the menu item here a student view. I'm going to right-click. I'm going to open this in a new tab. And now you're going to see me being the instructor in the tab you've been watching and the student over here. So what I need to do is I need to start the session. That's going to give me a session number. That session number I'm going to put in. Here I'm a student. I'm going to paste in the session number and hit join. <clears throat> now I'm going to look at the seat map. And I'll set in this chair, and I'll click OK. And now, as a student, I'm waiting on my instructor to ask me a question. I can at any time click, I don't understand. I'll do that in a minute so you can see it. I can send a private message to my instructor. Let's do that. Hey, are you going to ask any questions today? We'll send that. Now, back over here as an instructor, you can see that my students sent me a message. Hey, are you going to ask any questions today? Let's mark that as red. I'm not going to respond to this guy. He's kind of a goofball anyway. We have several questions. I can hover over them. I can decide to ask these in any order I want. So let's ask this first question. I'm going to deliver it. And my student now sees wake up and smell the blank. Let's type coffee. Why not? And over on the instructor screen, I see one response has come in. As more and more students answer, we're going to see bigger words for more popular answers, smaller words for least popular answers. I can even, if I want to, show this whole screen of the students up on the big screen. It's a great way, again, as I said, to spark students' discussions. I'm going to stop delivery on that question, though, and move on to this one. Let's go to this question first here. Which colors are apples typically? I'll deliver that, and here I see a many choice. Uh, what colors are apples? Typically, they're green and often red. Yes, I know some can be pink, but I'm going to turn that answer in like that. And on my instructor screen, I can see that I got those right. We'll stop delivery, and let me ask another question. Now, this is the one that I promised you something nice on. I said that. Uh, Matching questions are quite easy to write and answer. Looks like I've got a typo there. We'll forgive it. We'll deliver this. And over on my student side, I see bananas. I'm going to assume maybe my instructor meant yellow by that answer. 
Apples are often red, limes typically green, and oranges typically, let's go yellow just to mess with this. I'll submit the response. And on the instructor side, you can see, did I leave one out? Holy moly, I left one out. Change the response. Bananas, yellow. Apples, red. Limes, green. Oranges, we'll go with yellow. We'll submit that again. Now back on my instructor side, you can see here that right answers come in as green and wrong answers come in as red. There's only one student here, so you can't see what I'm about to describe for you. This is actually a heat map, and the more popular an answer is, the darker the shading becomes. So if a lot of people got an answer right, it becomes dark green. If only one or two got it right, it becomes a light green. And there's also a medium green for mediumly popular answers. But when there's only one student answering, there's going to be green or red. We'll stop delivery on that one. And now let me show you what a sketch question looks like. Here's a sketch question. We'll deliver that. And here on my student side, I'm going to see this says, please help the rat find his way to the end of the maze. Now, on a computer, the student would click and hold the mouse and drag to deliver the answer. If this were a smartphone, they're literally touching the screen and drawing right on it. Uh, over on the instructor side, you can see a student thumbnail come in representing each answer. I can hover over it and it shows a larger version. It does not disclose the student's name, so I can certainly even show this to the students if I care to. Uh, by the way, I can, as a student, change my mind. I can even do something weird like this or clear it and maybe do something goofy like this. But if I do that, that is going to indeed show up over on my instructor's page, and they'll see that. Uh, you would see all of these students' answers uh, over in the gradebook in the same way that I showed you earlier in the presentation. The system can't grade these images, so you would have to click uh, mark as incorrect if it happens to be wrong. It's going to mark these all correct by default. Uh, now, there's an interesting thought here. What happens if you're in the middle of your lecture, you're in the middle of delivering one of these sessions, and you all of a sudden realize, hey, I wanted to ask them about such and such, fill in the your own blank there, and maybe you forgot to put a question in. You can actually ask the question on the fly, so let me show you how you would do that. I clicked, let me show you that one more time, ask a new question on the fly. We're in the middle of delivering a session, and I'm going to write a brand new question, and the one I'm going to write here happens to be a region question. I'm going to say, please touch, click on a femur in this image of a skeleton. Again, I'm going to move my uh, web page over to the left a little bit, scroll down so I can see that add images button. I want a skeleton. Let me see which skeleton I want to use here. Let's go with that one. I'm going to add that image. And as I look here, there's a femur right there. I'll add another one. There's a femur right there. I'll deliver it, and I have not only written, but I've also delivered. It's out of my students right now. I'm going to click there and submit my answer. And here on the instructor side, you'll see the answers coming in. Forgive me. This thing has gone a little bit wonky on me. I'm not quite sure why, but let's deliver this one more time. <clears throat> Forgive me, I managed to get a second question on the way here. Let me ask this new question again. My own home network just took a little nosedive. Forgive me, I had a little bit of a weirdness in the system there. I'm going to try this one more time. Stopping delivery on that one and asking this one more time. Region. Uh, 
Please indicate a femur in the image of a skeleton. That one's actually kind of hard to see anyway. Let's find a little better picture here. We'll go with this guy. I like him a little bit better. Drag him onto the Add Images button. And we'll say femurs are there. Add another region. Let's get his left femur in there as well. And we'll deliver that. And now my student should see this. We'll touch and click there. Yeah, let's do there. And submit the response. Now on my instructor side, we'll see the answer come in. It'll be in just a moment. And you can see here on the instructor side that that answer came in as a green dot. Let me go back and change my answer. <clears throat> and I'll click up in the uh, chest area, submit my response there, and that will come in. That'll change to a red dot here in just a moment. Forgive my new puppy. She's wanting to have her lunch. Uh, and you can see there's a red dot. Uh, that's what it looks like. I'm going to show you one more question type, and we'll be done for the day. By the way, I'm going to turn on the reaction graph and let my students say, I don't understand. And you can see what happens if that happens. The red line jumps up. And we're going to do one more question type. We'll do a new question on the fly. In this case, we're going to do a direction question. And I'll say, please drag an arrow in the direction of flow for the Amazon River. And here, I'm going to find a picture of South America. I've got one. There's the Amazon. And I'm going to grab that and drag it on here. And then what I want to do is I want to drag out an ideal arrow answer. Now, ideally, the river should start over here and end over here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it in the middle and end over here. And we'll deliver. You'll see what I've done here in just a moment. Now, I'm going to take this and send it out to my students. And what my students can do is they can literally point any way. They can point back this way. They can point over this way. That would be a right answer. So I'm going to stop that, say submit my response. And over on the instructor side, we should see an answer coming in. And it looks like my answer came in perfectly. You can't quite see it there because it matches the uh, map. There's a green arrow pointing from here to here. The system colored that green because it's right. If I change my answer and point it back this way, that should come in as a wrong answer. And we'll see that update here in just a moment. You can see that. We've got a red arrow here now indicating that I gave that a wrong answer. That, folks, pretty much takes care of everything we need to cover for the day. If you have any questions, you are welcome to contact me. I am at fa.terryaustin at gmail.com. Uh, that address should find me. So drop me a message if you have any further questions. I want to thank you for your time. I encourage you to use Learning Catalytics. If you have any questions, reach out. Uh, and by all means, please consider signing up for our uh, strategy session for more uh, advanced training. Thank you for your time, and uh, hope you've enjoyed the day. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.